introduce Lillian McDermott, who is Professor of Physics at the University of Washington. I could probably spend the next hour easily giving a summary of Lillian's distinguished career, but I'm just going to pick out a few high highlights. Uh, Lillian was, a, was and is a pioneer in physics education research, uh, founding the University of Washington Physics Education Research a few years ago. We won't go back into detail of this. But it was really, as really the first uh, development of a physics education research group within a physics department, not the College of Education. And this was a radical thing at the time, and William pulled it off with great flair and great success, and of course now it's relatively common across the country. Uh, Lillian will tell a lot about what her group has been doing and how this is going to lead into some activities uh, you'll have with her tomorrow. But let me mention just two recognitions of her work. In 2008, the University of Washington Physics Education Group won the American Physical Society Award for Excellence in Physics Education, only one given out per year. And uh, this past summer, uh, Lillian was awarded the Melba Phillips Award by the American Association of Physics Teachers in recognition to her service to the association and to the physics community at large. Again, it's an award which is given out only occasionally to very distinguished folks. In case you don't know, Melba Phillips was a distinguished theoretical physicist uh, who was the first woman president of the American Association of Physics Teachers. And so the award recognizes her many contributions, both to physics research and to physics education. So I'll now turn things over to Lily. Uh, initially, this was supposed to precede the workshop you'll be attending tomorrow. So it is, uh, can you can't hear me? Yeah. Is it OK? You can't hear. OK, if you can't, let me know, because I don't like to just be talking, you know. <laughs> so um, it's not a typical research presentation, but it is partly a research presentation. And what I want to do is to connect it to the workshop, which you'll be doing tomorrow. You may not see the connection tonight, but hopefully you'll see it tomorrow. So um, this is who we are. We're in the physics department at the University of Washington. Three of us are full professors. We have a lecturer, somebody called a lecturer. Uh, her name is Donna Messina, and she's a K-12 teacher who's been with us for many years. Because one of the things that we do and have done on the side is uh, work with K-12 teachers, both pre-service and in-service. If we weren't doing it, the department wouldn't be doing it. So we started out that way. And we continue to try to keep that going. Uh, we have two postdocs who are research postdocs. And uh, we also have uh, had uh, 23 graduate students earn their PhDs for research on the learning and teaching of physics, which is unusual. I think we are probably, probably among the first or the first to have a program. Our graduate students take all the same courses, same qualifying exam, same everything everybody else does, but their research is on the learning and teaching of physics. And the students, there are, as I said, they've been 23. Right now we have four who are actively um, engaged in doing that, and we owe a lot to NSF. Without NSF, our group could not have survived for 40 years or so. So um, the uh, evolution, just very quickly, uh, we got started in the early 1970s. And uh, that was when Arnold Ahrens came to the University of Washington to start a course for elementary school teachers. And at that particular time, uh, we, uh, what had happened, I'll, I'll comment. I won't tell you the whole story. But at that particular time, uh, there had been a crisis in the financial life of Seattle. And although I was teaching part time at two universities, I had chosen unwisely but perhaps in the long term wisely, not to go for a regular position. I went part time. And so when the hard times hit, I was out of work. And so not knowing that someday I would want to be working full time, I volunteered. When Arnold came to Seattle to start this course for K-12 teachers, I volunteered to help him. 
My husband was very supportive, uh, and uh, I learned a lot. The, uh, over the years, what happened was as we worked closely with teachers, uh, both pre-service and in-service teachers, we had opportunities, because the classes were small, to talk to them individually and to find out how they were thinking. And this started us uh, on research, on learning and teaching of physics. And then, in addition to that, I volunteered to start a course for underprepared students who wanted to go into medicine and into sciences, who were underprepared to do well enough in physics to make it into the uh, category of students who would be admitted. So we began, sorry. So we began developing uh, materials, and I'll tell you more about that as the talk goes on. We began developing instructional materials that work very well with K-12 teachers and these underprepared students who are in the, usually in the calculus-based physics course. And from then on, what happened is we moved into the regular, all the regular courses, uh, from uh, everywhere from um, undergraduate introductory courses, sophomore courses, quantum mechanics, and the like. And we started working with graduate students, so it's been a whole span. But we started with teachers, and the opportunity it gave us was to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals. And what you find out, that people are very much alike in what they find difficult. Uh, they're not necessarily very much alike in how they succeed at what they find difficult, but they are very much alike in how they, uh, how they think about things. And then we work with TAs. So uh, I want to say a little bit about discipline-based education research. From our perspective, it is discipline-based. It is content-based. There's a lot of what's called DBER that has to do with other issues that are important in education. Lots of issues, social issues, psychological issues. But ours it are, are the things we study have to do with the subject matter basis of, uh, what, of physics content. And that, that we're not the only people, but it is what the position we take. So it's not traditional education research. Um, uh, you know, uh, none of us, neither Peter Napoleon nor I, have ever had uh, a so-called education course. I'm not boasting, I'm just pointing out the difference between our approach. And it's definitely the approach of somebody, who of people who identify with being physicists. And the focus is on student understanding of science content. And um, we believe it's an important field for scholarly inquiry by science faculty, in our case, physics faculty, in science departments. Why? You need to understand the subject well. You have to have access to students. And you have to influence the way physics is taught in your department. If you're not in the department, and let's say you're very fortunate if you're in a college of education, and the department will pay attention to you. But and I think that for most of us, you have to be in a physics department for the variety of reasons I mentioned. The, uh, belie we believe it's an important um, approach to improve student learning. And notice, K through 20 plus. 20 plus includes us. Because we learn, as we develop materials, we learn what we didn't know as well as we thought we did, and how we keep learning. So I just want to say that it's a very, um, very uplifting thing to do. Now, we see the teaching of science, uh, t teaching as a science. OK, you could argue. But I'll tell you why. Because there is documented research, not only our own but others, that many people encounter the same conceptual and reasoning difficulties in learning the same body of material. The same strategies work with different, we have data to show that. And I'll try to show some of that. Um, and they're generalizable beyond a given course, a given instructor, or institution. And they're reproducible. These are attributes of something that you would consider a science. And if you go to meetings and you talk about it, and if you write articles for referee journals, and if you communicate and help build a field, they become publicly shared knowledge that provides a basis for building new knowledge, which is what science is, um, is, is about. And we consider that a rich resource for improving instruction. So uh, what about teaching as an art? Of course it's an art as well. But uh, what do you look for? Well, is the instructor inspiring? 
Uh, what about his person or her personal qualities and style? Uh, what about have the students learned? And I have to tell you something about one of my early days when I was teaching at City College in New York. Um, I had a class, uh, a, a small section, uh, 20 students, uh, that were lecture, lab, and the whole thing. And I remember standing in front of the room and talking and seeing this student with big brown eyes, I even remember the color of his eyes, uh, looking and just drinking it in. Well, I tell you what, when the first exam was over, he was at the absolute bottom of the class. And that taught me something. You can't necessarily tell by how much they love you how much uh, they learn. So uh, that's not linked to student learning. And so what you have to do is have specified intellectual outcomes I'm going to illustrate. So uh, what we do is we try to increase the research base on student understanding of physics, undergraduate instruction, introductory and beyond, K-12 teachers, we've never given up on K-12 teachers, pre-service and in-service, and professional development, graduate students, postdocs, faculty. However, we're within a physics department that is research intensive, and there are constraints. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of them, but I will go over some of them later. Um, so as I said, our perspective is we consider research in physics education as a science. What do we do? I'll illustrate. Conduct systematic investigations, apply the results, develop strategies, try them, test them, pretest them, post-test them, until we get consistent results. And when we do, we send them to pilot sites who also do the same and get feedback. And I will, uh, we get feedback and can do something about it. So we document what we do and we report our results. And this is what you would do in an empirical applied science. And that's our position. Uh, we do systematic investigations of student learning, and I'll illustrate this too. Something called individual demonstration interviews. They are modeled loosely after Piaget's clinical interviews, which he administered to children 16 and under. These are administered to university students, and I'll give you an illustration later. And then we pretest and post-test. Pretest for us means after traditional lecture instruction, before what we are doing, what we have done, is before those materials are used. So when I say pretest, it doesn't mean a vacuum. It means the students have gotten all they're going to do from a traditionally, all they're likely to be able to get from a traditionally taught course. And we try to identify what their difficulties are and what the prevalence is. And then we post-test. And we make these pretest, and I'll illustrate that, pretest, post-test comparisons to decide, did we really uh, figure it out or were we misled? And sometimes you can be misled. And then we talk to students while they're learning. So anyway, this is the way it goes. Research, curriculum development, instruction at the university. And then after it appears that the materials are good enough, uh, they go to what we call pilot sites. And we have two nationally distributed curricula. One is physics by inquiry, primarily developed for the preparation of teachers. And the other is a, a compromise, tutorials in introductory physics. And uh, they're supplementary to a lecture-based course. It's one thing if you have teachers, prospective teachers, all day for two hours a week, three times a week. It's another thing if you have these students once a week for a 50-minute hour. What can you do in a 50-minute hour that can help? And that's what I'll mostly talk about today. So I've got examples. And the examples go up in difficulty. But they make a point, And you won't have to be knocking your brains out to figure out what you might get. But geometrical optics, electric circuits, and mechanics. And these are models that we help the students develop. So I just want to illustrate. And this is some of the literature. It's all been published. OK, what could students do? Well, very typically. They could solve problems algebraically in geometrical optics. And here's a, well, a, simplistic, a simple question, OK? Uh, predict where the image would be located. Most students can do that. So you say, well, if they learned something. Well, I'm not so sure. Because uh, when Fred Goldberg came in 1982 uh, on sabbatical to uh, visit our group because he wanted to switch from atomic physics experiment to research in physics education, he wanted to work on physical optics. And I said, oh, Fred, that's hard. 
why don't you do geometrical optics first and sort of get, you know, find out what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So he came, I'll mention he stayed for two years and hardly ever got to physical optics. Now let me show you the kinds of questions. So here the uh, student and the investigator are sitting in a room, there is a brightly lit bulb, there is a converging lens and a screen. And this is an individual demonstration interview, both before and after instruction, the same thing. Uh, now, predict what would happen on the screen if the lens were removed. Well, you say that's a question. Well, 50%. This is a class that had been working these problems, that had the lab. They actually had the lab with a lens, a converging lens. But it didn't really register here. The formula registered, but not what it meant. Uh, if the top half of the lens is covered, well, what do you think they said? Most people can guess. Top half covered, half a lens, half an image, OK? But really, what happens is that the image is dimmer, but it's all there. Uh, what happens if the screen is moved toward the lens? The image disappears eventually. And uh, these statistics were gotten from a written form that was given to, he, I, think, uh, I think Fred interviewed 60 students, but to much larger classes. And this is what happened after the lab and after uh, all formal instruction. But we never asked those questions on the tests. We ask questions, I'm exaggerating a little bit, that fit 1 over s plus 1 over s prime equal 1 over f. I'm just mentioning that. So uh, that was very sobering. And um, they didn't recognize that the principal rays locate the image. They're an algorithm. They're not necessary to form it. And that the area of the lens affects only the brightness, not the extent of the image. And for every point on an object, a corresponding point on the image, which is the main point here. But there was something much more fundamental. They didn't have a functional understanding of a basic ray model for light. Namely, they could draw the pictures. Light travels in a straight line. Every point in an object is the source of an infinite number of rays emitted in all directions. They can say that because you can memorize it, but I don't think it meant much. So let me show you uh, the results of um, uh, a set of uh, diagrams uh, given as a, uh, I guess, as a pretest, really, uh, before or after standard instruction in calculus-based physics. Standard instruction means the lectures and that, no tutorial, uh, which I have to, haven't explained yet. Sketch what you would see on the screen, explain your reasoning. I'll give you half a minute. No, not that's too long. I haven't got that time. So single bulb. Um, you have uh, this. And uh, let's see, I should have the, oh, there you are. So for the triangular aperture, single bulb, 90% get it. Two bulbs, two images, 60%. Long filament bulb, 20%. In other words, they don't see the light as coming from all the points on the object going to, through the triangle and eventually building up a series of triangles that look like a trapezoid. This is very fast, and if you don't get it right away, let me tell you a lot of other people don't either. Um, so about 10 years later, 10 years um, later, we uh, decided to come back to this, and um, we decided to eliminate uh, the, um, to eliminate the lens and see what we could do about it. So um, we developed some materials, and they led to 70, more than 75% correct on various combinations. However, this is so easy, that isn't good enough. So we tried to improve it. And we tried lots of different things. The thing that finally worked was a bulb that was uh, uh, frosted, a frosted bulb. And when the students saw and envisioned the light coming from all the different points on the frosted bulb, uh, they uh, did very well, 75%. But I mean, it's still a lot better. Now, we have two faculty, we had, we have, who were very committed and very appreciative of what we were doing. And they thought, oh, this is too easy. Why spend time on this? So one of them did lectures, did ex demonstrations in the front of the room, homework, a lot of, and the other one did other things, 
but they were all directed toward helping the students get this right. What happened is they didn't do nearly as well as the students who had worked in the lab with real materials, even though, even though there were the calculus-based students, you know, I'm talking about the calculus-based course, one of them was an honors section, even though they were um, uh, good students, even though the professors, these particular ones, were good professors, something didn't take place up here because they're not used to being asked this kind of question. So this is some of the literature that's been, that we've done. And uh, now I'm going to switch to another topic. We're working our way to where we're going to be tomorrow. Um, the students could solve many end of chapter circuit problems by applying Kirchhoff's rules. They could. That's required in the course. What couldn't they do? The bulbs are identical. The batteries are identical and ideal. Rank the bulbs from brightest to dimmest. You now have half a second uh, to come up with an answer. And uh, formulas won't do it for you. But A equal D equal E uh, for brightness. And brighter than B equals C. Now what happened? OK, correct response given by 15%. Uh, this particular time, and typical of other times, of students in the calculus-based physics course after they had finished the subject, the topic, excuse me. Uh, high school physics teachers who teach this material, same 15%, I mean 15%. Uh, university faculty in other sciences and mathematics, I'm not putting this on you, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, graduate TAs and postdocs in physics, at that time approximately 100. 70%, much better, much better. But it's not exactly overwhelming. So um, uh, and it didn't matter. The interesting thing is, it didn't matter if it was before or after instruction. Most of these students had had geometrical optics in high school. But it didn't matter. Uh, the scores were the same. They didn't change much. Now you're going to probably, uh, Eric Mazur shows this often, but I can't resist showing it too. He gave, he uh, gave, two problems. One is obviously complicated. It is. I tried to work it. I know it is. The other one is something you look at and you say, that's a problem uh, when you short out one of you know, the other bulbs. Uh, and he found that the students did better on the quantitative problem than they did on the conceptual one. And he'll probably tell you that unless he's changed what he says during these things. And the, the, it was worse. So uh, what were the problems? Conceptual difficulties with electric circuits. These are DC circuits. Belief that the battery always puts out a constant current. Belief that current is used up in a circuit. That did not come overnight. We've looked at papers. We've looked at many, many, many uh, explanations. And these are the two most common serious mis uh, belief, uh, mistaken beliefs. Now, you'll notice I'm not using the word misconception because that trivializes the problem. People say misconception. All you need to do is just fix it. Fix that one. Fix that one. But in physics, these concepts have to fit together. And you can't fix one without fixing them all at the same time. So uh, what they didn't have was a conceptual model for an electric circuit. Uh, I said this again already. Concepts in physics are interrelated and can't be fixed in isolation. And we found, in general, this is generalizations, on certain types of qualitative questions, student performance is essentially the same over a wide range of ability, before and after instruction, calculus-based, algebra-based, descriptive doesn't make any difference, with and without standard demonstrations. That's not to say demonstrations aren't good. It's that they don't do this for you. With and without standard laboratory, not to say that laboratory isn't good but unless it's approached in a certain way. Large and small classes, and um, let's see, what was the other one? It didn't matter if they loved the instructor or not. Being loved doesn't necessarily determine what's being learned, but it's nice to be loved. So um, anyway, hearing the lectures, reading the textbooks, seeing the demonstrations, doing the homework, doing the lab experiments had little effect on student learning. So there's a gap, a gap not between the instructor and the curriculum, but between the instructor and the student and the student in the curriculum. But it's greater than most instructors realize. So uh, traditional instruction in physics is based on our perspective. Our present understanding of physics, 
We understand something now, and guess what? Because I understand it so well, I'm going to explain it to you in a way that you can't miss. A lot of us think that. Uh, and that I can transmit knowledge to you. And uh, it's my perception of the students understanding because they go like this. Um, and it doesn't recognize that instructors and physicists, in this case, and students are different. For future physicists and some K-12 teachers, the gap isn't that big. They're going to be the future physicists. You know, you probably all know this. But in the US, about 5% of a calculus-based course is going to major in physics, on the average. That's a very small percentage, very different from Europe. And um, the differences are large for most students and most K-12 teachers, who at best often have taken the introductory course and at very best have majored in physics. But that doesn't necessarily prepare them to teach this kind of materials. And as a result, students often tend to view physics as a collection of facts and formulas. And they make less progress on concepts and reasoning, and it's in green, than they could. And that's, of course, the message. So we need to do something different. And we call it guided inquiry. And that is teaching by questioning. Not any old question will do, but a question that will force the student to go through the intellectual exercise of going from here to there. If the steps are too big, nothing happens. If the steps are too small, very little happens. So uh, we have two curricula, physics by inquiry, which is primarily intended for the preparation of teachers, and why tutorials introductory physics. And I will have to say something by, about that later. So we have developed what we call inquiry-oriented materials. They're laboratory-based. And students construct a conceptual model based on what they find in the laboratory in simple experiments. And we try to get them to develop a mental picture that will help them uh, do the reasoning and uh, give explanations and also address what we know they have trouble with. How do we know? Because we've been with work this material through with thousands of students. And what you find, even the very brightest and the not so bright often have the same problems. The difference is the brightest can hide it. The brightest can do mathematics. OK, the math tells me the answer. The students who are not adept, that's how you find out what's wrong. Then you go to the students who are much better, and you ask them certain kinds of questions, and you find they have many of them the same problems. So um, I haven't got time to talk about that. So OK, so now we have a post-test. Virtually all teachers, K through 12, kindergarten through 12, develop a conceptual model that they can apply to relatively complicated circuits. Rank the brightness of the bulbs. Give you less than 10 seconds. So uh, E is brighter. Okay, all the current goes, that goes, goes through E. A and B, it splits. And uh, C and D, uh, there's less current through those. Now, if you have a model, this is, not a, this is not a problem. Now, you can do it. You can do it using Ohm's law, even though it doesn't really apply, the relative ranking. But my gosh, by the time you finish with that, you could really have missed it. So, um, uh, so the application of research and teaching experience in the large introductory course, that was our challenge. We have, uh, I guess, 1,500 students taking introductory physics at any one time in the calculus-based course, another 800 in the algebra-based course. I mean, that's enormous. You can't have little 20 people sections in something like that. So we wanted to come up with something the department would accept and do something about it. So we knew the students had to be engaged, and it needed to be practical, flexible, sustainable, and acceptable to our colleagues. You can't forget that one. So um, we uh, decided we go for in in incremental change, evolution, not revolution, by recognizing the constraints of a large course and that we would develop research-based tutorials. Why did we call them tutorials? Because in the 1990s when we started doing this, that wasn't a word that was used in the US the way it was used in Europe for part for education. Uh, so we, we pick a different name. It's not different anymore. So the tutorials supplement standard instruction. And having small group tutorials that I'll tell you about later, if there's time, or tomorrow maybe, 
uh, that are compulsory. They are required for the students to attend. Uh, and that led to the tutorials in introductory physics. And the point I want to make here, it's not our curriculum that I want to point out. It's tutorials that do the same thing. The problem is most people don't spend the time, haven't got the time, or won't put in the time it takes to, put, to do this. Therefore, if you don't want to do it for yourself, we've tried. Use our materials because we have tried and we can show that they work. But you can do your own. It doesn't have but the idea of a tutorial in which you go deeply into a topic is the way, uh, is, is the way that we think you should do it. Now, um, what about standard presentation? Can they do the reasoning to apply the concepts and principles? And so the tutorials, instead of being problem solving sessions, which are typical of the once a week discussions, sessions that you have, the emphasis is on constructing the concepts, developing the reasoning, relating the physics formalism to the real word, not on solving quantitative problems. And I'll make a comment here. Does that hurt their problem solving ability? Not for the typical problems that are asked in most introductory physics courses. So this is our particular situation, just to give you a, give you a context. Three lectures, 50 minutes, one lab, two or three hours, a tutorial, 50 minutes. And um, the views can vary. If you're in a two-year college and you have a smaller class, you don't have to have tutorials at the same time every week. We do. With 1,500 students in these classes, we have to have, uh, it has to be highly organized. So uh, the way we do it is we give the students a pretest. The pretest doesn't mean that they haven't studied this material. In principle, they've had it in lecture. So they've already had the material in lecture. And then we come up with qualitative questions to tell us where they are where it comes to the reasoning. And then um, there are tutorial sessions as students work through worksheets in which we have tried to design a path to go from here to there. And then they have homework. Now, two critical things. They, they are guaranteed 25% of every midterm and final will be on the tutorials. They come to class. They turn in their homework. Because if we made it voluntary, uh, I don't even want to say what would happen if we made it voluntary. So, all, so uh, we, the post-tests are given on the exams. So you can't quite, you know, they're, they're monitored the post tests. And uh, then the TAs, in our case, the TAs, sometimes undergraduates, but TAs, have to come to a weekly seminar in which they take the same pretest as the students. Look at the students' responses and work through the tutorials in the way we want them to help the students learn. That's how we do it. So um, pick geometrical optics, electric circuits, and um, uh, now the one for tomorrow. So um, uh, I also should mention that this research I'm going to be discussing now started in the 1980s and continued in the 1990s. And so uh, here is a glass table, uh, dry ice pox, a reverse vacuum cleaner, stream of air that you can keep at a fixed distance from the pox, and you'll see the questions. Pucks are pushed with constant force between starting and finishing lines by a steady stream of air. The students see this. It's part of an interview uh, in which there is a person demonstrating this, and they are there, one at a time. So uh, it's comparison. After crossing the finish line, do the brass puck, uh, B, and the plastic puck, P, have the same or different kinetic energy or momentum. That is the pretest. So since I was going to hoping uh, that you would have a copy of the pretest, imagine you have it so that you can really participate. Because if you don't, you're missing some of the fun. Um, OK. Now, uh, most of you, um, probably all of you, uh, recognize that uh, the kinetic energies are equal because uh, the force is the same, because the same vacuum cleaner with the same distance um, for the, um, um, between the, the nozzle and the, is, is exerting a constant force. And you can see 
one of the, it's a plastic puck, it goes very fast. So there's no question that the momentum of the brass, uh, brass puck is greater than that of plastic puck because uh, the force and the time make a difference. The, the, the brass puck takes much longer. The force is the same because it's the same nozzle. So it, it's, it's really not a problem. Um, we always like to have people do it so they can have the full experience, but you're going to have to miss out. Um, so what happened? Well, the honors physics students on uh, the kinetic energy comparison almost all got it. They, there aren't many n equal 12, but that n equal 12 is representative. Uh, algebra based physics students, nobody got it. This is after they'd had it in class. And momentum comparison. Um, in the calculus based physics course, we were able to, to also give these questions as written questions, and you can see uh, it's not good. So, uh, so what happens? I want to show you an interview now. Uh, so the interviewer, the investigator, what ideas do you have about the term work? Student says, well, the definition they give you is that it is the amount of force applied times the distance. Okay, is that related at all to what we've seen here? How would you apply that to what we've seen here? Well, you do a certain amount of work on it for the distance between the two green lines. You're applying a force for that distance, and after that point, it's going at a constant velocity with no forces acting on it. So you're feeling pretty good. Uh, okay, so do we do the same amount of work on the two pucks or different? Uh, we do the same amount. Uh, does that help us decide about the kinetic energy or the momentum? Well, work equals the change in kinetic energy. So you're going from zero kinetic energy to a certain amount afterwards. So work is done on each one, but the velocities and masses are different. So they, the kinetic energies, are not necessarily the same. In other words, they don't get what the theorem is about. And I'm telling you, this is not, if you look shocked, please don't look too shocked, because I don't, well, I don't want you to be too shocked. Um, but you know, if the, this is a point I think you should make here, one should make here. If you quit asking questions too soon, you can be under the illusion that people understand. And it's the patience of the person who did this. In this particular case, Ron Lawson, my fourth graduate student, I think, uh, was the interviewer. And that told us something. It wasn't really registering up here. So uh, the causal reasoning was not complete. So short responses, even if correct, do not necessarily indicate understanding there is a need for probing. So let me give you a, few, a couple of examples only. Uh, common and correct explanation. The momentum of the plastic and the momentum of the uh, brass uh, are, are the same, instead of is what you see is the correct answer. Uh, this, is the, this is the reasoning it's, that we recorded. Small m, large v, equals large m, small v. Why? It has to. Uh, momentum is conserved. I memorized that rule. Uh, same F, so same momentum, and same kinetic energy. One example. Another example. Um, the momenta are the same, instead of the momentum of the plastic buck being less than that of the brass. Compensation, this is it. Small m, large v, la equals large m, small v. Any evidence? Of course not. Momentum is conserved, memorized rule. Same F, so same momentum, and same kinetic energy. Uh, compensation for kinetic energy. Small m, large v squared, is equivalent to large m, small v squared. Doesn't matter what those numbers are. Uh, I just want to impress upon you that you, you'd be shocked. We were. Um, so the right answers for the wrong reasons. Uh, and these compensation arguments, this is bigger, that is smaller, it means it's equal to this is smaller, that is bigger, and that they don't understand cause-effect. So we decided we needed a tutorial on the work energy impulse momentum theorems. And um, tomorrow, uh, we're going to do that, work our way through it. And uh, what we have found that certain generalizations on learning and teaching that we have inferred and validated by research and used in our curriculum development have been very practical. And they are illustrated, the reason I'm mentioning it to you, in the context of physical optics in the Ersted Metal paper on the DVD that I think you're getting or have gotten. Um, 
And here's, here are some generalizations I'm not going to repeat, which you can probably read. The students don't make connections. They need practice. Uh, certain difficulties are not overcome by traditional instruction. Advanced study does not necessarily increase your understanding of basic concepts. That if you want to do something to take care of conceptual difficulties, they have to be done uh, carefully. Uh, stu students need to go through the reasoning. And that's the issue I really want to emphasize. The most important, I think, benefit, of possible benefit, of a physics course is the development of reasoning ability. The other things don't matter nearly as much. And since only 5% are going to be physicists, they're going to develop it anyway. But the others may not. And that's a good opportunity to do that. And the teaching by telling is ineffective for most students. Teaching by questioning and keeping your mouth shut, if you can, is more effective. Uh, students have to be intellectually active to develop a functional understanding. And qualitative questions, not ones that have a numerical answer easily available, uh, are essential for your determining whether they understand or don't understand something. So, uh, and growth and reasoning ability, say the obvious, does not result from the usual instruction. And this is just a way of expressing an idea that the tutorials are just an example, our example. There are other examples. Uh, how you can develop the type of qualitative understanding that can make physics meaningful students, provide a foundation for quantitative problem solving, and develop ability in scientific reasoning. Because as I think I already said, the most important intellectual benefit from introductory physics is the development of scientific reasoning ability. That's what they can take with them, most of them. So thank you. I, I, I was afraid to look at my watch, because I felt if I talked any faster than this, even I wouldn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lily. We have some time for our questions or comments people would like to make. Yeah, because I have more time, yes. Uh, sure. So how, how can we employ your approach, inquiry-based inquiry physics teaching, well, on, te on teaching theoretical physics? Well, theoretical, you start. You, 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 might not, you might not immediately have a concrete real world example. That's true, but if you start with something for which you do have concrete real world examples, you have a pattern of the kinds of questions you need to ask yourself whether you understand or don't understand. So you don't start, I don't think, I, I, I don't think you should start with really abstract advanced physics. So we have quantum mechanics tutorials, too. But you don't start with that. Uh, you find that students, graduate students, many of us. Uh, so when we say students, we also mean graduate students, right? Not just Yes, but I, I, yes. when I say graduate students, I'm not putting graduate students down. Uh, they do better. <laughs> they do better than introductory students by quite a bit. But they, what happens is you can go on pretty far in physics. And it doesn't catch up with you until later when you're teaching. Uh, I have been in front of a class and uh, lecturing. You know, I've done that too. And all of a sudden, I say to myself, uh-oh, I don't really understand that. <laughs> and, and guess what? I'm in charge because I'm the lecturer. I go home and beat my brains out. And then the next day, I come back. You know, yesterday, this came up. And uh, I meant to say, I don't know if I said that, but, uh, but let's, let's think about it again. But you know, you're in command when you're the lecturer. You're not in command when you're teaching by questioning. And now you say it's only one student, or two students, or three students. True, it's easier to be wrong with two or three than it is 350 or 400. But I was just pointing out that it's a habit. And you can carry some of that into more advanced work. The tutorial we're going to do tomorrow is harder than these. I mean, it's not that hard. I don't want you not to come. Uh, <laughs> and you're going to work together. So no one will know, uh, you know how much anybody can do. I just try to make the case. You don't start with very abstract material. But even material that's not quite so abstract uh, is, is a better place to start. 
And I would say you could do your own. The problem is it's hard work. And one reason we have these materials, which by the way are nonprofit, we don't get anything for them, uh, is so that people who are doing other things as well don't have to spend hours on the work energy theorem, for example, because we've done it. Now, you could say, I can do it better, fine. But it's there. And so one way is to use materials that have been developed and that are both research-based and research-validated. By research-based, you pick up any textbook now, almost, and it says, this is research-based. Doesn't matter. If it isn't research-validated, if it hasn't been pre-tested and post-tested, it's somebody's bright idea about what works. That's not all bad, but it's research-based isn't good enough. So we try to produce research-based and research-validated. We never quit. It's never good enough. The third edition, or second edition, I guess it's the third, second edition, is coming about two or three years late because then we kept finding something that could be better. You had a question? Yes. Do you think it's a good idea to have the exam based on this question? So when we, really, when we test as a student, we, instead of we tested them the regular way. Oh, oh, I'm not arguing that. I'll tell you what we do do. One fourth of the exam is this kind of question. The other three fourths are whatever the instructor uh, wants to ask. And sometimes 20%. 20 to 25% is a question for which you cannot solve strictly by formula. OK, that's a good amount, because you have to have skills. You have to be able to, everybody knows, to do those things. But if that's all you can do, you're missing something. And, and that's what I was trying to say. So a combination is what we do. Besides, you have to have, have, make peace with the rest of the faculty. Uh, remember, in, in your case, I can tell you in our case, the introductory course is taught by a wide number of people. And we all have to agree. So we have meetings till we can come up with something everybody agrees. Now, not all questions are going to be the same, but the tutorial question will be the same. And they have to approve it. And they always do. Yeah. Do you, have a, do you know of any similar resources for Gen Ed astronomy classes? For one more time. So Gen, Gen Ed? Astronomy classes. Oh, astronomy. Oh, yes. You're going to hear from somebody uh, tomorrow. Uh, early in the day, right? Ed Prather. Ed Prather. No, I know who it is, obviously. He was our student, by the way. I just have to point that out. Um, uh, and he, there'll be astronomy. It'll be on astronomy. He was our student as an undergraduate when he had dropped out of school and came back. And he was in a class for underprepared students. He um, works as an instructor in our classes and then got, went and got his PhD in physics and astronomy at Maine. And now he is a faculty member in Arizona. So he will. You get astronomy. Any other questions? Yeah. You look like you moved. You just moved your hand. Oh. Keep it still so I don't get misled. OK, over there. I have a question. I don't know if this is appropriate to ask you now, but um, it's kind of more of my question to the workshop. Yes, this is awesome stuff validated. Well, you, you try different things. I mean, you can try different things. And these are not incompatible. What would be incompatible if somebody said, look, the way to do this is to memorize everything. That would be incompatible with using the tutorials. But something else that involves peer instruction, what they call peer instruction, uh, that involves um, uh, other kinds of uh, interactive instruction. You, try them, you can try them all, but you probably shouldn't try them all at the same time, because it'd be very hard. But you don't have to do it all when you go home. You got to survive your first or second and third year. Anybody else with questions? Yes. I also notice the same thing that conceptual questions are generally um, very hard for many of the students. Um, so as also you mentioned, that if it's a conceptual difficulty, it's common for uh, many of them. Of course. So do you have a collection of these conceptual difficulties, like 
for Yeah, but you see, the names don't tell you everything. I could say, this is a conceptual, this is, this is, this is, this. But in physics, the concepts are linked to one another. So if you say, this is a difficulty the students have with current, they might, you might say. Yeah. But that's not independent of potential difference. Yeah. It, it's not. Uh, and you but, can, and you just said if you have a collection of these. Yeah. Well, I can give you some. Um, they, it could be, could it be a good resources. No. Um, for be, no. Uh, no, no, no. I'll tell you if you don't know what to do about it. I mean, I'm not saying. The question was if you have a collection of questions, could it be good? Well, for example, uh, uh, co your conceptual difficulties. I'm using that. Notice I'm not saying misconceptions. I'm very careful about that. Uh, for example, current is used up. That is a very common belief if you ask certain kinds of, of questions. So now I know current is used up. I know, please forgive me, uh, people think that current is used up. People think that the battery is a source of constant current. So I tell you these things, but it doesn't tell you how to deal with it. It doesn't tell you how one triggers another. Uh, you have to really go through the whole thinking process. And you can't cure your students by saying, no, current is not used up. Just remember that. Uh, we have ways of dealing with it. I didn't have time. But for example, suppose I know something's very common. I know it from experience. So I pose a question, and it elicits just what I know. In other words, it elicits from the students some statement that indicates they believe current is used up. OK. Then I try to get them to confront that. Is that what you really think? Uh, do some experiments. Resolve it. Have them resolve it. But don't do it just once. Once is never enough if it's deeply held. So uh, they've got to reflect on it. They've got to uh, try it again uh, because it comes back. I mean, if you really believe intuitively, like many do, I'm giving you an example, the current is used up. Uh, if you really believe it, it's not going to go away because I looked at a set of bulbs and saw they were equally bright, uh, regardless how they were connected in series. It's not going to go away. So that's why giving a list doesn't do it unless you work on each piece of the list and then try to bring them together. It's hard. I learned a lot in doing this. Uh, we all learned a lot. And from tomorrow's tutorial, we all learned a lot. So uh, you don't have to be um, um, terrified. <laughs> because maybe you learn, too. Or maybe you can say, I knew it all the time. Well, maybe. Anyway. Yes. So um, in my experience, the, one of the difficulties I sometimes face is that there's always this sort of um, incompatibility in some sense between the amount of the material that you have to cover and the time it takes to do this Absolutely. Inquiry. So you have to make choices. Okay. You really do. I mean, the typical introductory text, uh, you have to decide what's important. What are they going to carry with them? Does their thinking improve because they know some more facts, or does their thinking not? It's impossible. I mean, they're getting, you noticed, haven't you? They're getting thicker. Thank Lillian very much for her presentation.